Good morning, everybody, especially all you high school football fans. Let's go over the Saturday games from uh, Thanksgiving weekend's Texas high school football playoffs. Stripping Springs opened up at the Alamo Dome with a very strong 50 to 27 win over San Antonio John. Welcome to the Behind the Mic podcast. Today's guest, sports broadcaster Anson Massey. And now, here's your host, Jordan Smith. Welcome back to another episode of Behind the Mic, a sports media podcast. Got a special interview here for you today, but before that, don't forget to follow, subscribe, whatever platform you're listening on, Apple, Spotify, YouTube Music, wherever you listen and enjoy your podcast from. Uh, and then also, if you're listening on the Spotify platform, we also have a Q&A and a poll question for you as well. But again, welcome to the podcast, and let's also say welcome to another special guest, our second guest on the show. Uh, his name is Anson Massey. He is a sports media guy, a, a advertising uh, you know, guru, if you will, uh, <laughs> and and does a lot of different things within uh, the, the sports realm. So Anson, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me, Jordan. Hey, congratulations on the podcast and all of your successes. Uh, you've, you've been moving up and up ever since I met you a few years ago, somewhere on the top of a press box, I think, somewhere, trying to put some video <laughs> together, doing play-by-play on a laptop. <laughs> so yeah, congratulations was, to you. I'm happy to be here. I appreciate that. That was uh, that was an interesting night for sure, one that <laughs> I won't forget anytime soon. Um, <laughs> Good football, but, though. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, just... I guess to kind of start, just introduce yourself a little bit to to the audience and tell them a little bit about you. Yeah, definitely. Um, high school sports is probably my my passion. Radio is my passion. Uh, I didn't realize this, but uh, November will be 29 years that I've been in the radio business. I was 16 years old when I started. That obviously dates me. Uh, currently living in Waco, uh, working for four really cool radio stations here. Um, I'm still linked to my uh, station KNES out of Fairfield that I do a lot of really good work for, some great people that own that station. Anywhere I can I can work radio, and um, I, I do sales for them. I do commercials. I also do a lot of consulting work. Uh, I help teach radio stations how to make money with their radio station, and I work with advertisers and keep them up with the latest marketing trends. Of course, I swing them to radio because radio is still a great way to do advertising, but Sports has always been my passion, high school sports. I host a scoreboard show on Friday nights. It's a regional show, heard on 11 affiliates. We're trying to add more for this season. We're still in talks with several right now. It's, uh, and it's hard to believe it's that time to start planning and getting ready for, for another high school football season. But uh, I just love radio like you do. I love being around sports. I love being around guys like you that have the same passion for it. And uh, I just keep doing what I do every day and uh, hoping to, or being blessed to be a part of it. Yeah, absolutely. Radio is radio is one of those those careers that you get into it and you don't realize it right away, but you you eventually find out there's a little bit of a magic, I guess, to it for for lack of better terms. But there's there's something within it that that kind of keeps you drawn into it. Uh, once it gets in your blood, it it stays in there. You just you cannot escape it. Um, you know, I tried to a couple of times. I, I and. I talk about all the things I, I, I do and have done. I've done anything from, you know, sports to play-by-play to scoreboard show, sales, programming, music, uh, and even being in the helicopters uh, during my days in Houston uh, doing reporting from the helicopters. It just shows to make a good living in radio, you have to be versatile. But once you, once you get into it, you can't get it out of your blood. It's just something you can't get rid of, and I love it. So I guess kind of talk to me a little bit about – what it is that drew you to media, to sports, to kind of this the advertising career? Kind of what drew you to to this business per se? I wanted to be a sportscaster, and I eventually wanted to be an ESPN sports anchor when I was younger. This goes all the way back to when I was maybe five and six years old. I just uh, I love listening to the radio, listening to the Rangers. Uh, my dad always had the Rangers on. Uh, Randy Galloway, we listened to a lot driving around town. My dad's a veterinarian, still is. And we would drive around out in the country, sometimes late at night, pull a calf. And we would have Randy Galloway on, the Rangers on, the Cowboys on. Uh, I remember going dove hunting opening weekend, Labor Day. And uh, the Cowboys always had the Sunday night game, you know, back when Troy Aikman was was there. But 
Um, I, I just, I don't know where it came from, but from when I was a very young kid, I just was drawn to sports and being a sports announcer. Uh, I, I went to a lot of Texas a and football, basketball, and baseball games as a kid. So I was, I was, I was put around it, outdoors and sports. That was my thing. And um, when I was 16 years old, I had the opportunity to work at KYCX in Mejia, uh, my first radio job. I'll, I'll tell you this story. I was a, I was the after-school DJ. I would drive from Grosbeck to Mejia, 15 minutes every day, uh, just run the board for a couple of hours. And the, the owner, his name was Matt, came in one day, was training me. It's my third day. Gave me a quick rundown of the board, told me to talk if I wanted to. He was off to New Orleans with his family and shut the door before I knew what had happened. And I was there by myself on my third day. So I had to learn quickly. Um, and everything else just kind of came naturally. Uh, I, I hit everything with both feet, fell in love with it, did commercials. Uh, David Campbell, uh, he's out of College Station. He's from Mejia. He did the play-by-play at the time for uh, for the Mejia Black Cats. He taught me sports. Um, a, a huge inspiration for me in high school sports was Craig Way. I would watch him on television doing the TV shows. Uh, it was high school edge or the high school extra is what it was. And then, of course, he mm-hmm. did the games, the state championships. And uh, lo and behold, uh, I get out of college in 2000, and I sent a tape to Austin. Uh, I had a mutual connection there. It turned out I, it was Craig that heard the tape, told the program director to get me there. And we did that. I did a statewide scoreboard show that flagshipped out of uh, AM 1300 The Zone uh, in the year 2000 or 2001. And I was off and running and uh, met a lot of people along the way. Craig was so good to me, took me under his wing. Uh, and I had the utmost respect for him. And Bill Shoning was in the building also right before he got the Spurs job. And I got to see a lot of things that a small town boy never would have thought he'd get to see. So uh, everything else just kind of came natural. I, I was told I had to learn how to sell to make money. So I learned how to sell. I've studied marketing ever since and just got uh, enriched in the business. I wanted to learn how to do everything in a radio station. And, uh, and and be the, the best help and hand I could be. And I'm, I still learn every day, and I'm still looking for other things that I can do to contribute wherever I am. So I guess kind of talking about that, like you said, in order to be in this business of radio, you got to be you know versatile and in a lot of different things. You got to learn know how to lo- do a lot of different things within the media business. Um, you know, and you've already mentioned doing sales and marketing the play-by-play, play, and then the scoreboard show, which is kind of the, the, the top-crowning thing that you were talking about before we started that most people know you for uh, is the scoreboard show. Kind of talk about just kind of the different aspects of everything and just kind of what all, like, every, go into detail with every little thing that you're doing as far as, you know, different career fields. Well, I'll tell you this. The industry has certainly changed a lot in the uh, almost 29 years that I've been around. When, when I broke into the Austin market in 2000, uh, that's when, when iHeart or Clear Channel was starting to buy out radio stations. So over time since then, the, the live and local philosophy has, has disappeared or is almost a thing of the past now. Me, along with some other really, really awesome people, are, are still trying to keep that alive. And when I say live and local, I'm talking about live DJs, breaking news, sports, weather, and traffic in your larger markets, uh, and also getting out in the community. Uh, we, we did a remote here a little over a week ago here in Waco at, uh, at a manufactured home place. Uh, we had tickets to a rock concert, and we hid those tickets with other prizes inside of the mobile homes. And people had to come and go through the homes with the sales staff and actually find those prizes. So any opportunity you can get the listeners, the radio station, and the advertisers all mingling together uh, for the same cause, that's a positive thing. And that means you're out in the community, you're giving things away, you're giving people a chance to interact with the personalities and uh, the sales staff at the radio station. And to me, that's very, very healthy for any community. And radio is really the best uh, best media to use that for because of the creativity. And that's what I talk to my radio station affiliates about is keeping that philosophy alive instead of just sticking a, a recorded DJ from who could be anywhere on your station. Yeah, it sounds good, but what if there's breaking news? What if there's severe weather? Um, You know, how are you going to do remotes? How are you going to get out there and be a part of the community and and really help push business when a time uh, in a time where money is very, very tight and uh, advertising dollars have to be more carefully spent. So how can we stand out as, as a group, as a medium, um, doing things like that, being creative with your promotions and being active in the community 
and again, getting all getting everybody to interact together in that little synergy, I like to say, uh, that's what makes it work. High school football is another way to do that. I love the scoreboard show because most high school football fans are only concerned about their team when they're going to the game or maybe on their way to the game. Um, you listen to the pregame show if you have one, uh, especially if you have a prediction show. But when the game's over and they get in that parking lot and get in their car to head home, they want to see what everybody else did. And I love bringing that to the, to the listeners and to the high school football fans because everybody wants to know, you know, well, what, uh, what did Mark do? What did Crawford do? What did Austin LBJ do? And, uh, and I've always taken a lot of pride at being in the studio and giving them that opportunity. Uh, update the standings, scores, uh, what are the playoff races like? I'm the only guy in the state on week 11 when you tune into my show when the scores come in, I have the pairings and a lot of the time, date, and locations done because I've talked to all the coaches who are very, very good to me throughout the year. And I love bringing that and giving that to them. Play-by-play is awesome. Uh, I, I did a lot of it during my career, but I love being Friday, being on that studio Friday night and uh, being able to give them what everybody else did and something to listen to on the way home to get them home safe. And you kind of touched on it with the, the scoreboard show a bit. Uh the connections that you've made with the different coaches over your career and administrators and things like that. I feel like sometimes, especially for those, those new aspiring people in the, in the career, that's something that maybe gets overlooked a little bit, or at least is a hard thing to approach in the sense of when you're getting into the business, you don't know how to approach coaches and, and administrators uh, the right way, trying to build that relationship and thinking I'm, you're going to try to get everything right away. That kind of takes time. Talk to me a little bit about that process of building those relationships with those different uh, people with all the different schools and districts around the state and how that's helped you build what now, like you said, is a pretty much first reporting uh, scoreboard show, especially when it comes to the postseason, on what everything is going to look like. Respect. Uh, that's That's number one. The high school football world is is pure and unique. And as a broadcaster, whether you're doing play-by-play or whether you're doing a scoreboard show, anything you're doing broadcast-wise for the high school sports community, you have to understand your place in the pecking order. These are not professional athletes. The coaches are not just coaches. They're also teachers. They're mentors to these kids. Even the coaches and the schools that go 0-10, 1-9, that haven't made the playoffs in a gazillion years or whatever, there's still something that those kids are going to get out of being a high school football athlete. And there's something that those coaches have to offer to those kids and to their communities. And we, for, for the last probably 15 years or so, it's gotten easier to put a broadcast on the air for a high school sports events. Uh, you have the internet and now you have apps that opens up to more people that are wanting to get up there and, and maybe play sportscaster. And I'm probably gonna step on some toes here, but I, I, this is just my message and what I've learned. You're talking about somebody's kid. You're talking about a coach that is somebody's husband, wife, father, mother, relative. Uh, these kids have relatives that are listening in. They're not being paid to play. They're paid. They're playing because they want to represent their community. And they're out there giving it all they got, no matter what their record is. So when you get folks that, uh, that get into the booth or get on the air and try to treat them like they're professional athletes or million-dollar coaches, and you're criticizing them, I don't think there's any place in the business for that. This is a unique world that has to be built on, on a positive message. Uh, even if a team loses 62 to nothing, if you listen to my scoreboard show, I, I will never dog a team that loses by that much. You won't hear a negative word come out of my mouth, and I won't let anybody on the air that will that will do that. You don't criticize a coach for going on going for it on fourth and three. You don't criticize. You shouldn't criticize a coach for having a losing record. Uh, you know, you, you deal with the talent that you have, but. These, these players, these kids, and I'm not talking about just football, every single sport, uh, even band, cheer, drill team, anybody that gets out there for a high school event at every sport, they're doing it because they want to and they take pride in their community and their families. And uh, there should never be anything negative about that. You, you want to work your way up and do college and professional sports where there is room for criticism? Okay, great, do it. But not at the high school level. And I take a lot of pride in that when I go on the air of whatever I'm doing, whether it's working with you when we've got to pair up or whether I'm doing my scoreboard show every Friday night. 
uh, it's a it's always going to be a positive atmosphere. If if you're negative and critical, go do something else. So, I guess kind of looking at those different things, your your on air career, it's encompassed multiple different roles. Uh, sticking to the scoreboard show versus the play by play aspect, um, kind of talk about the the differences in how you approach those, how you prepare for each one differently, uh, how much time goes into prep, so on and so forth, because. There's a lot of people that don't realize how much work actually goes into everything leading up to the day of the event. It, most people think you show up, you grab a roster, and you just start talking, but that's actually not the case. I, I wish it were that. If it were that easy, everybody would be doing it. Uh, <laughs> the most important thing you can do, uh, and it, it kind of goes back to the respect and to the positive, if you're going to do a proper service to the teams you're broadcasting for, and, I, and I'm talking about both teams, if you're a play-by-play guy for this particular team every year or every game, you still owe respect to the op- to the opposing team. Um, I, I encourage everybody to have a straight down the middle broadcast, uh, just in case somebody from the other community is listening. But when it comes to prep, talk to the coaches. This is when you get the opportunity to build that relationship with the coaches and with the administrators because they will respect the fact that you are taking time to put in the work, get to know the team. What do you like to do in these situations, coach? Tell me about your leaders. Uh, oh, and here's something that's very important, pronunciations. How do I pronounce this guy's name? Uh, and, and do that during the week. Uh, can I get a two-deep starting lineup? Can I get some statistics? And then when you get that information, how do you implicate that into your broadcast? Uh, and, and you know this, Jordan. You'll have a ton of information for every single game, but you only might use this much. So you have to prepare yourself mentally for when you're going to bring certain things out, what's going to matter in your broadcast. Uh, so you have to get... And you don't know what that's going to be. You need to know all of this, but you're only going to use this much. So you have to prep for that. But the coaches, the players, anybody listening, especially friends and relatives of the players and coaches, they're going to respect the fact that you took the time to make sure it's a good broadcast. You want to put them in a positive light, and you're going out of your way to do that and putting in the work. Scoreboard shows the same thing. I, I want to get to know the schools. I want to get to know the standings. I love talking about the coaches. I love getting the opportunity to interview some coaches uh, during the show sometimes. And uh, knowing that they're listening on the school bus ride on the way home is, uh, is, is very big to me because they respect the fact that I do a lot of prep work to learn about what, you know, if I'm talking about this team, uh, Lamarck over Dayton, 34-17, third year in a row, they've won this matchup, Lamarck third round of the playoffs for the eighth straight year. You know, you find those little nuances to bring into a broadcast, but you have to do the prep. You have to study for it. And to do that, you have to take pride in what you do. You have to be passionate about getting behind that microphone, whether you're doing a game or whether you're doing a scoreboard show or a pregame show, whatever part you play, you know, take the time. So and you've already you've already mentioned one, uh, but kind of give me another a funny or a, a weird story uh, that that's going to happen in any portion of, of your career that kind of kind of <laughs> stands out, whether early on, uh, more recent, kind of give, give one um, that that really sticks out to you. Well, uh, funny stories. Uh, any funny story that you have from any broadcaster is going to be that hot mic moment. Uh, you know, this is another lesson for anybody. Treat every mic like it's on. You know, watch what you say. If you think you're off air, you may not be off air. Or maybe some administrators might be listening to what you're saying on a separate channel. Um, I'd have to really think about funny stories. I have a lot of great stories, a lot of great moments that uh, that I still pinch myself that I got to be a part of. And, um, you know, one, one of those was my first season at uh, AM 1300 The Zone, Sports Radio 1300 The Zone. Um, I... I started that year spotting for Craig Way on Thursday nights. I just showed up on a Thursday night, asked if he needed any help, and he put me in. I spotted for him all year. That earned me an opportunity to be a sideline reporter for a few playoff games. My first one was at uh, Waco ISD Stadium. I think it was on a Saturday, cold, cold afternoon. Uh, Round Rock McNeil took on Coppers Cove. Uh, Great game. But at the end of that season, I got to be a second sideline reporter for Westlake and Midland Lee's state championship game where Cedric Benson Injured, growing, and all, uh, led Midland Lead to a state championship. There's third straight. Uh, he, he's still uh, the late Cedric Benson, an unbelievable athlete, probably one of the greatest I've seen at the high school level. But, you know, from Grosbeck, Texas, to Memorial UT Stadium, uh, I don't remember the, what they call the stadium now, but uh, it's a Longhorns home stadium. I'm calling a state championship game. 
Craig Way was doing the TV broadcast. John Madani uh, was doing the uh, the play by play, and I was on the sideline. Hugh Lewis on the other side. It was uh, it was just a that was a great day. That was probably probably one of my greatest days because it was so early in my career, and I realized that I had an opportunity to to be a part of some really great moments. And I would, I'd watch these games on TV, and now I was a part of it. So that's probably one of my favorite stories to tell because it was so early in my career. Something this is kind of geared more towards the the youngsters uh, in in the business, the ones who are trying to get started, don't know how to, or the ones who are just starting and just trying to build up a portfolio and everything like that. How important, and you and I have have talked about this before, uh, but how important is, is networking for for this industry? It is the most important thing. Because if you want to break into the business, most of the time it takes knowing somebody that's going to open a door for you. And they may just barely crack that door and you can stick a little toe in there. But most importantly, when you network, you have to show somebody that you really want to be there. Go out and tape a ball game, uh, whether it's a local high school game, a little league game, get your little tape recorder or your phone nowadays. Just sit in the stands and broadcast the game. See if anybody will listen to it. Send it to as many people as possible, but uh, don't tell somebody you want to be in the business and then just wait for somebody to call you. That's that's not going to happen. And if that somebody tells you, hey, send me a tape or, hey, do this or, hey, come to the booth on this night and you can watch us and ask questions, do it. <laughs> Show them that you want to be there. Uh, be proactive. Like I said, make a tape. Uh, do it on TV if you have to. There's plenty of sports on television. Just sit in your living room and, and tape the game. Get the roster, you can get it off your phone, you can print it off, and do something that indicates that you're willing to work, you're willing to be proactive, that you really, really want to be there and are passionate about getting your start in the business. And when you get an opportunity, it may not be what you want to do at first, pay your dues. If somebody says, hey, I want you to spot for me on Thursday nights, show up and spot for them. Talk to them, listen and learn to what they do. Uh, Take them to lunch or call them and Learn as much as you can. Show that you can be a sponge, that you're capable of learning, being taught, and being proactive. The most important thing. And kind of bouncing off the the end of that question uh, that you just had, kind of talk about you know maybe some some roles that you've had to fill throughout your career that when you started you didn't necessarily have the idea of okay I'm probably going to do this to get a job doing what I want, but if they're telling me this is what I got to do, then I guess I'll do it. They kind of tell me about the with the weird oddball jobs that maybe you didn't think about when you were thinking about doing this career that have, have popped up and then eventually led to a job in the future. Calling the TAPS Swimming and Diving State Championships on TAPS TV while I'm sitting on top of a high dive uh, was one of them. Uh, <laughs> ne- never knew I'd be doing those sports, uh, but it came up. They needed a broadcaster to do it. When they called me, I said, sure, I'll go. Uh, And it it goes all the way back to the beginning of my career. You know, you know, I wanted to be a sportscaster. Well, my first radio job was being a DJ. I had to learn how to be a DJ. I eventually became a morning show host when I was in college at KNES in Fairfield. And then I get the call to, um, hey, uh, can you go do this playoff game? You only have a cell phone and just get, get the game on the air or, hey, we want to do volleyball. Can you broadcast volleyball? I'm going to try. Pick up the gear and go and, and see what happens. Um, I, I did high school volleyball and then uh, private school volleyball. That led to getting a gig at the Southland Conference Tournament. I got to do TV, internet TV, for the Southland Conference Tournament. I'm still learning volleyball. I had a referee that was not working a particular game sit next to me, and during the breaks, he would give me the lingo and tell me how to use it, and then I'm trying. I'm writing it down, and I try to put it into my broadcast. And he told me the broadcast was a hundred percent improvement from the first set to the last set. And uh, you know, I it was an opportunity. Uh, I got paid pretty well to do that gig, and I did that because I was willing to pick up the gear and go do high school volleyball, which doesn't get the uh, the attention that it should get. Those those girls put in the work that the football players do. They work very hard, just like band, just like cheer, just like everybody else. They deserve a chance to be on the air. And, um, and I'm, I'm trying to think of anything else. Um, if you and I were talking at lunch, I could probably have all the stories in the world, but asking for a specific <laughs> one, there's, there's been so many, I, I just, I, I learned early on that you had to be willing to do everything and not just do the game, but I had to go sell it also. 
Um, that's where I met our mutual friend, Gerald Sanchez. We both worked for the same network uh, where we had to go out and sell and then go do the games. And just be willing to do whatever you have to do, uh, whatever sport. If you want to learn how to be a broadcaster, be versatile. If you don't know the sport, learn it. Find it on YouTube. Call somebody that's in the game. Ask them how to, you know, what's the lingo? Learn the language. And then go do the best you can and make sure you continue to learn. All right, we're going to throw some uh, some some rapid-fire questions you ready. You ready? Go for it. All right. So <laughs> your first one. <laughs> Pre-game, you know, pre-game, pre-game day ritual or routine that you follow before you go on air? Food. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Food is very food is very important to me. Um, I, I, I get to my destination first, press box, field, wherever. I set up. I get that out of the way like three hours early. Um, I make sure I know when the teams are going to arrive. I've already made arrangements with the coaches. I know when and where they're going to be for any interviews I need to do. And then I look for the best local restaurant I can find um, and make sure that I'm well fed before I go on the air. Very important. <laughs> well, it's funny because question number two, favorite game day snack or meal? Golden Corral. Okay. Okay. A buffet guy. But, oh, oh, yeah. I love buffets. I mean, you're, you're seeing me from the neck up, but if you look at me out in the real world, you can tell that I like to eat. That that's why I'm yeah that's that's why my camera is positioned the way it is yeah I'm I'm, I'm with you there, um, so I guess here's a question since you've done both things um, number three on our rapid fire what's your preference radio or TV play by play, radio, by far, uh, I've done TV a few times only a few but radio I I don't like having to worry about how I look and how descriptive that I can be. TV, you don't have to be as descriptive because it's right there, obviously. I love painting a picture. I, I love being able to put everything that I can into it and, uh, and give the listener the opportunity to, to see it in their mind and, and describe it in every detail that I can. Easy. That's an easy answer for me. Uh, number four, favorite game, or I guess really a memory, I guess, from, from your, your sports scoreboard show? Ah, from the scoreboard show. Uh, let's see. I, I don't remember what year it was, but, um, I think it's about five or six years ago. Uh, you know, obviously the last two weeks is when things really come together and you rely on a lot of games going the way they should go. And I had everything drawn out and week number 10, we had a lot of upsets, messed up my sheets. Week 11 was even worse. I had to go back and completely redo a lot of the district pairings that I had and uh, it, was a, it was a fire drill because there were a lot of games that were going late, either overtime. There might have been some weather delays or something in the area. So by the time we hit air, we, all, we still have a lot of other possibilities. There's points. Um, one particular game, it was a two-point game, and the team trailing had to either kick a field goal or they had to score a point. They were one point short of going to the playoffs, even if they lost the game. And they end up not getting it, so the other team goes in. But uh, getting to put all that together as it happened was an adrenaline rush. Um, I loved it more than I thought. I was exhausted by the end of the night. But the, the fans that were listening, they got the full story. And we still we were able to put it all together. But it was crazy because so many games, we had so many upsets, so many games and scenarios did not turn out the way that I had predicted them. And I thought they were no-brainers. You know, you put your no-brainers in, then you have your ifs. Uh, but the no-brainers, a lot of them flipped. Still don't know why it happened. Just one of those nights that the football gods gave us. It was a great night, but it was stressful. Uh, and finally, here in the rapid fire, anything that you've regretted during your career? You know, no, not really. Um, any of us that do this for a long time can look back and say, I wish I would have stuck with this and done this. I wish I would have done that. I, I get a lot of calls to do play by play for, uh, for colleges. Uh, I'm still sought after quite a bit, um, more so I think than I deserve, but you know, I made a choice, uh, that one, I love doing the scoreboard show on Friday nights, but it also keeps me close to home. But two, the play-by-play -play route takes your weekends away, and it's hard to be a family guy. I'm a, I'm a husband. I have, uh, I have three unbelievable teenagers, teenage boys, that I take care of. Uh, love them to death. They're my world. And that's just – I chose to go that route instead of the play-by-play -play route. 
but it kept the door open for me to do my scoreboard show. So it's not a regret, but it's something that I could have done different based on what I broke into the business wanting to do. Um, I did have an opportunity to work at ESPN and eventually be a sports center anchor, and I turned it down because uh, I just liked the path that I was on. I wanted to stay down here in my home state of Texas. So no regrets. I, I love the career that I've had. I'm still loving the career that I have. But there's always a different direction. You could always look back and say, I could have done that. It might have been fun, but it would have changed life drastically. Uh, finally here, before we get ready to sign off, uh, any advice that you have for people who are either just getting started or who are wanting to start but aren't sure really how to, kind of what's your advice for the younger generation of sports media? Uh, learn. Never stop learning. Stay humble. Uh, this is a business that's, that's full of egos. It just is. Uh, put it aside. You can still do solid work without it. You know, like, like I said before, make sure that those you're uh, trying to impress, they know that you want to be there, that you're going to put in the work. Be versatile and uh, be humble and just do your job. And, and remember what your job is. If you're calling a game, even if I'm doing a scoreboard show, it's not about me. It's not about the play-by-play guy. It, it's about the game. You, you want the listening audience to remember the great play of the ball game and not what the broadcaster said whether it was funny, appropriate, inappropriate. You don't want to be the memory. Like, like referees and, and, or officials, the best ones are the ones you forgot were there. You want the fans to enjoy the game and the game experience and listening. And here are the sponsors. You don't want them to remember something that you said or did. So make sure you know what it's all about when it's all said and done. All right. Where can uh, people find you online? Uh, well, I'm on TikTok. Uh, just look up AQ Massey. Uh, YouTube, same thing, AQ Massey. Uh, I'm on Facebook. Uh, you can find me, uh, look up Anson Massey. Uh, I've got Massey Sports as well and Massey Media. Uh, you can also find me, um, I'll, I'll throw this out there one more time, TexasPregameMeal.com. I told you I like to eat. I've created a website where you can search by school by area and find those great places that love to entertain high school football uh, or high school sports, youth sports audience. It's available for all sports. So you can find my story there and uh, you can find all the great restaurants across the great state of Texas that we're still building there. Uh, TikTok is where I'm most active, though. Um, I need to be more active, but uh, that's where you'll find me. And at KNES uh, Texas 99, we have an app. You can listen to the scoreboard show. All right. Well, Anson, I appreciate you coming onto the show and uh, taking some time out of your weekend to, to talk a little bit about your sports media career. Jordan, it's been a pleasure. Again, congratulations to you and keep doing the great work that you're doing. I hope we get to talk again. Absolutely. Looking forward to it. That'll do it for episode seven of the Behind the Mic podcast. Again, special thank you to Anson Massey for joining the show here this week. Don't forget to follow, subscribe, whatever it is on your podcast platform, whether it be Spotify, Apple Music, or even YouTube, or anywhere you download, listen, and enjoy your podcast. Also, don't forget, this will be up on our Patreon as well. At least we will, starting in August, have a video version of this podcast available available for you on August 1st. So be sure if you haven't done so yet, go ahead and subscribe to the Patreon. So that way you won't miss out on any of the podcast content I upload on there, as well as all the other blog content, behind the scenes videos on my game prep, my career, everything else, and any and everything else that also gets uploaded to the Patreon. There will be some special things coming up as well that will be added to the Patreon. So you don't want to miss out but again that'll do it for this week thank you so much to everyone for listening and if you listen to this point be sure you leave a comment uh, down in the q a or whatever it is wherever you're listening on the onto this podcast and talk to me about what you like the most about this episode i appreciate you stopping by and i'll see you next week for another edition of behind the mic a sports media podcast Thanks for listening to the Behind the Mic podcast. Listen to every episode of Behind the Mic on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and YouTube Music. Open any of these apps and search Behind the Mic. Then hit the follow button so you won't miss a single episode.